Good evening and welcome to Lowell Observatory and our year-long celebration of this telescope behind me, the 4.3 meter Lowell Discovery Telescope. Uh, this is a really exciting year for us. 10 years has passed already since we saw first light with this. And so every month we're gonna be celebrating the telescope. Um, we're gonna talk about, uh, mostly throughout the year, we're gonna talk about the research that's being done with this. We'll talk about the instruments that are used. Um, we'll talk to astronomers both here at Lowell and our partner institutions. Um, and I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. Um, tonight, we're gonna to kick it off um, with two people that are more intimately knowledgeable about the telescope than perhaps anybody else. Um, Dr. Jeffrey Hall, um, the director here at Lowell Observatory and Dr. Stephen Levine, one of our astronomers um, who from the beginning has been involved with developing the um, Lowell Discovery Telescope and just opened it up earlier tonight. Um, so to, for this series, we're going to talk a lot of, about a lot of things. And tonight it's really difficult because we came out here. I haven't even been out here for, I think it's over a year now because of COVID. And we want to talk about everything because there's so much cool stuff here. Um, but we'll try not to do that. We'll, do, we'll spread that out throughout the year. Um, tonight we're going to talk about, you know, why we even have this telescope. What was the need for it um, years ago? And, and how we developed it and some of the challenges we had in building the telescope. Um, so throughout the, this uh, one hour presentation, if you have any questions, you can uh, put them in the comment section or chat section as you're watching and we'll get to those as we can. And then we'll also um, answer some at the end. So um, Jeff and, and Stephen, um, first of all, you've been involved with Lowell Discovery Telescope since I guess, PD, pre-discovery or whatever, PLD. So just to, just to start off, let's hear from both of you about, about how you first got involved with the Lowell Discovery Telescope. Jeff, you wanna start? Um, sure, thanks, Kevin. And, and yeah, the, the, the PLD era was actually MGLT, the Next Generation Lowell Telescope when it was originally uh, conceived. You know, I've been at Lowell for going on 30 years now. I came here in 1992. And at the time, you know, our, our, our flagship telescope suite was this wonderful old, you know, 100 year old 1.8 meter telescope at Anderson Mesa and nearby where I spent several hundred nights observing a 1.1 meter telescope. And just before I had come to Lowell, the trustee at the time and the director and the staff had made a strategic decision about the observatory's future. And the question was, are we going to concentrate, you know, be mostly a museum, you know, concentrate purely on, on outreach, or do we want to remain a forefront center of astronomical research? And the conclusion was that that, that track, the research track, is what we want Lowell Observatory to continue to be. And to do that, you need premium tools of the trade and one to two meters. There's lots of good science you can do with a one or two meter telescope, but there's also a huge array of use cases that just require more glass, basically a bigger light bucket. And I can remember giving talks to the advisory board as a, a dewy-eyed postdoc in my first three years here about, you know, what would I do with a four meter telescope at Anderson Mesa? Because that was kind of the thinking then. And over the years, that concept evolved, but really that was 19, four, uh, 1994 to 2012 that we got to first light of this marvelous new facility. So almost a two decade journey, not unusual for a facility of this magnitude, but it came very much directly out of the observatory's desire to provide outstanding research tools to remain a preeminent center of research and discovery and astronomy. And Stephen, how did you get involved with all this? Well, it, it actually is interesting because it goes back to before I was working at Lowell um, I, I used to work across town at the U.S. Naval Observatory, and I was involved in some fairly large survey projects, which were data intensive. And one of the Lowell astronomers approached me to understand what it would take to be able to store and serve uh, large amounts of data taken by cameras designed specifically to do surveys on an early version of what was then still the NGLT. And so this would have been 1999, roughly. Um, and my first real taste of the project was to 
map out a, if I had to build you a system to handle all the data for however long for the survey that was being talked about, how would you do it? Uh, and was the, you know, Or what would anybody do with that? I was capable of a guy uh, to depth we didn't use before. And it was then almost 11 years later that uh, the then director of Lowell approached me and said, We need someone to commission the telescope that is being constructed now. And I figured once in my life, someone would hand me the keys and say, here's a brand new four meter class telescope, make it work. And so it was a, it was an, an offer one couldn't refuse. Um, and, and, and we apologize, it sounded like Stephen cut out there a little bit. It reminded me of Forrest Gump when he's about to speak at the Lincoln Memorial and suddenly the sound speakers go off and then you hear the end. <laughs> but it, and, and I should point out that, um, that Stephen and I are both at the, at the telescope. Stephen is on the other side of the room. I'm situated so you can see the telescope behind me. And this telescope, the main mirror is this right there, <laughs> is it somewhere up there, um, is 4.3 meters in diameter, 14 feet across. So it doesn't look that big, but I'm 20 feet away from it. Um, and Jeff, it was interesting, you were talking about early in your days a little about you know, what would it be like to use a one or 1 1.5 meter telescope? And the secondary mirror that's up there, that's about the size of that secondary. So the main mirror is 14 feet across. That's a huge increase of what we had before. Now- yeah, It's enormous. Um, yeah. Because of course your, your, your light gathering capacity goes as the, the square of the aperture because of the size of the mirror. So it's a huge advance over one meter of aperture. <clears throat> And it, it is fair to say, to, to put it in context, the secondary mirror, which is the small one, is larger than many people's dining room tables. So Jeff, you had, you had mentioned before, you know, the decision to build the telescope, really to, to maintain our role as a modern research facility with modern research um, resources. Why did Lowell decide to build our own that, you know, the more typical um, example is maybe we have several partners that you own a small part of the time. Why build our own and invest all that money? Right. I, you know, ownership of our own facilities has been a linchpin of Lowell's unique strength in research for ever since its founding 120 uh, eight years ago at this point, you know, when, when Percival Lowell brought in the Clark Refractor and the, the virtue of instruments that you own yourself is you can go out to them night after night, month after month, year after year, and carry out you know, programs that can tease out some of these phenomena that don't necessarily play out on short timescales. Um, you, you can do programs like that, of course, but there's, there are many programs in the area of what we call time domain astronomy that our ongoing access to our instruments is uniquely suited for. A great example is you know, my own program, which I came to Lowell to study the activity cycles of the sun and stars like the sun. And you know, the solar cycle is 11 years long. To see these morphologies you and, and to see all of the surprises that stars have in store for us, you have to observe steadily for 10, 20, and you stitch together with other programs, even 50 years. And what comes out of those observational records is remarkable insights into the nature of these complex physical systems. So, so that was remaining very true to, to what Lowell has long been as, a, as a, a center of observational astronomy. The Clark Telescope is this magnificent bookend of one end of our history, then the LDT is the flagship at the other end. You know, Jeff, I just realized that, you know, you're, you're telling, talking about your time at Lowell and you can start telling it in terms of solar cycles. Um, how many solar cycles you've been here? Yes, yes, I've been here for about 2.7 solar cycles, which is pretty frightening. <laughs> so, so, so you're telling, talking about the, the value of having your own telescope, but we do have partners on this, scientific partners, 
Um, Steve, maybe you can talk about that just a little bit of, of you know, how, how, why we brought in scientific partners. Well, there are several very good reasons to have partners from a science perspective. It means the group that you interact with so that you have a variety of, you know, I mean, science cross pollinates. You're doing something interesting that may be different from what I do, but I can look at that and see parallels or see ways it might impact me. But there are also very pragmatic reasons. A facility like this is expensive and we need to be able to afford it. And partnership is, is also a way to help pay off the cost of something like this. The, the nicety is that we have five current partners, all of whom I'm delighted, I have been delighted to work with over the past decade. Uh, and you know, we work with Yale University, Boston University, the University of Maryland, and Goddard Space Flight Center, the University of Toledo, and our neighbors across town in Flagstaff at Northern Arizona University. And the great thing is it means that we have a community too. And they do all sorts of different things, many of which we don't necessarily do at Lowell, but we get a chance to see what they're doing. Um, and it pushes us to be our best. It pushes us to, somebody in Maryland says, I'm trying to do this kind of can you can it happen? It's different from what we've tried to do. And we say, yeah, we can do that. And so it it's sort of pushing us to be our best, but also pushing us to get the best out of the facility. Um, and, and, and and so I would say no, I, I can just, I, and, and to add on to that, Stephen, you mentioned um, Yale. And you know, one thing that, that partner institutions bring is they bring really cool new instruments to the facility. And Yale has supplied this magnificent spectrograph. And the purpose there is to do extremely high precision measurements that allow you potentially to detect Earth man mass planets around sun-like stars. But the beautiful thing there is as you're trying to observe the planets, and this is one of these time domain programs, you're observing the stars. And so now our faculty member, Dr. Joe Lama, is really sort of picking up the conclusion of my research program, which was a continuation of an even older one. So this is because of these relationships, we're able to continue the kinds of programs that have been underway here at Lowell for literally decades. And Jeff, you, you have mentioned, we're talking about the investment we made and you know we decided to build our own telescope, but what was at stake? Uh, so we, we decided to build it ourselves. You know, was that, a, was that a big deal or was that something that we just folded into the budget or <laughs> what that look like? No, so, uh, so in the final analysis, remember, this ended up being a $53 million project once it was fully commissioned with the, the instrument cube and the, the initial suite of instruments, $53 million. When we started, when we inked the deal with Discovery Communications to begin, to begin building this telescope, the observatory's entire balance sheet was about 35 million. So just like that, you know, we're, we're almost, we're, we're more than doubling our balance sheet. Um, the, the other thing that happened, of course, is, you know, in the early days, we thought this was going to be a $20 million project to get this done. But we figured we'd better be really conservative and assume it would be 25. And then, well, actually, it's probably going to be 30. And then once we got a project manager who really worked through it, it's like, well, it's going to be 44. And then by the time we built the instruments, 53. So the, the financial risk with this project was literally ex existential. You know, if it had failed in some catastrophic way, you know, the, the destruction of the mirror or, or something just didn't work, I don't know if the institution could have survived. We literally bet the farm on it. And so how did, how did we make it work? I mean, if our net worth was 30 whatever million, well, 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 so how, how many hours do we have on this, this, this live stream here? Um, so I think fundamentally we made it work because of, well, honestly, people like Steven and just an extraordinary team that built this thing and commissioned it and had the drive and the talent and the dedication to make it happen. It was a very small team that, that built this thing. Uh, we contracted many components out, but we also did many in-house, the whole software system. Um, and you know, it was a full-on, full institutional effort that went from 
everybody from, from the design team to management, right to the trustee at the time, Bill Putnam, who committed the resources from the Percival Lowell Trust to finish the telescope. And that's, that's why I'm calling this existential. We were in hock to the to a to tune of a very large sum to get this thing done. And, and by gum, we did it. And Thank you know, that brings up an interesting point. Um, and we should point out that originally this was called the Discovery Channel Telescope. And then I, I guess it's been a couple of years now, um, the, as the name has evolved to Lowell Discovery Telescope. Um, but but we, we've talked about, for years we talked about uh, the DCT, the Discovery Channel Telescope era or the LDT era now, maybe explain what a little bit that is because it really ties in with how we bet the farm and how it really impacted the rest of the observatory. Um, the outreach program, really everybody at the observatory um, played a role in it. So Jeff, maybe you can talk about that a minute. Uh, absolutely. Um, yeah, you, you know, the, the degree of, to which we had to bolster our technical group, you know, we, we had to hire the construction team, you know, then you need instrument scientists, you need a commissioning scientist, which is why we eventually hired Stephen to come in and do that. Um, but the fundraising needs, you know, you need a fully professionally staffed uh, fundraising department to make that work. Um, the, the, the implications for the size of the budget, the number of people, that affects your administrative needs. So, you know, a project like this transforms an organization financially, operationally, and culturally. You know, we're a very different place than we were 12 years ago, and we're still evolving. And, and that's important. It's not just to construct the telescope, but after you have it built, you have to be able to operate it. And that's a whole different thing also, um, this really redefine the observatory. So, so we made the decision. We're going to do it. Um, we sign agreement with Discovery Communications, and then we start putting together a plan on what the capabilities are going to be um, and what this is going to look like. So Stephen, maybe you can talk about that a little bit, kind of the early days of how do we decide what this telescope is going to do um, and how do we narrow down the vision of it? Because, because there are so many different things, different directions we could go with it. Well, it, it is actually an interesting progression. It's really an organic evolution. Um, very, if you look at some of the very early discussions of the telescope, there were capabilities that were discussed specifically to address uh, both outer solar system and inner solar system, especially near Earth object survey desires that ultimately don't exist in this telescope as it, as it stands now. Um, but basically the idea is you start with what kind of science do we want to be able to do? And early discussions where we'd like to be able to do wide field surveys for Kuiper belt objects and trans-Neptunian objects, as well as wide field surveys for near earth objects, which were both follow and both evolved logically from existing large scale programs already in existence at the observatory, but on smaller facilities. Um, and, but the telescope, there was also a need for the telescope to be able to do a wider range of kinds of programs that might be smaller scale in terms of total resource need. But it, let's put it this way, telescopes these days are often thought of in the sense of either they're sort of a Swiss army knife where they can do a lot of things, but they're, they're sort of designed to be general instruments or they're built specifically to do a project. And initially there was a hope to do some of both of that um, in the end, you know, Jeff has already alluded to how the finances kind of grew. Um, and so some of those capabilities were in the end not, not designed in. Um, some of the wide field stuff we could still implement later, but has not been implemented in version one. But much of the general cases are, are in the telescope. Uh, and there was a very interesting, very concrete change that was made, oh, I would guess around the early 2000s. There's an early design of the telescope that had this idea that at the top end of the, you know, you, you have your telescope tube, and at the top end you have mechanism. And the idea was to be able to address the field case and 
the let's do everything else case, the whole idea was that the top end would tumble and you could flip it. And on one side, you'd have a regular mirror. And on the other side, you'd have this wide field camera. But the cost to do that and the engineering challenges ultimately meant we couldn't. Um, it would have added easily 10 to $15 million to a project that was already finding out it was a little more expensive than we'd planned because as you put a top end like that on, everything gets bigger. And as everything gets bigger, everything gets more expensive. And so we haven't ruled those capabilities out for the long term, but we did not include them in the original designs ultimately because we just, we had to balance pragma, you know, essentially pragmatism and the various science cases we wanted to do. And so the LDT now turns out to be a wonderful telescope for people who wanna do things that require multiple different kinds of instruments on the same program in the same night, but it's not a particularly good wide field survey instrument at the moment. So, you know, if I come in and say, I need to use an imager to take a picture of something, and then I wanna get a spectrum of the object in that same field, I can do that, which is something that, you know, within 10 minutes of each other. And that's not something you can do at most large telescopes. That kind of quick, quick switch is, it seems like a simple thing, but it's not so simple when you start to get to the instruments of the size you need for a telescope like this. Um, well, you know, we're talking about developing the, the telescope itself and the instruments that would go on to it. Um, but there's also another aspect of it, location, location, location. Um, where are you going to put it? And there's a lot that goes into it. And Jeff, maybe you can talk about this, especially Jeff is your role as one of the, the leaders in um, dark sky protection. Um, there's obviously light pollution. And, and But besides that, there are a lot of factors in where to put a telescope where it's going to be optimal. So how did we end up here 40 miles outside of Flagstaff? Why not just put it up at the observatory and it would be convenient to get to for everybody? Right, right. And, and I see this. This is a question specifically in the chat from, uh, from John. And I think we just probably covered a question from Tom about what we decided we needed in the design of the telescope. But yes, site selection, if you're going to plunk down $50 million, you want to be fairly sure you're putting it in the right place. Um, now, Flagstaff, is, has, has probably the most exemplary dark sky protection measures in the world with all the, the amber lighting and the skies above Mars Hill are actually quite good given that we are one mile from downtown of a city of, of 80,000 people or so, but not nearly the quality you want or need for a facility of, of the size of LDT. So in around 2003, we spent um, the better part of a year performing site measurements at several different sites around Northern Arizona. It was actually a, a, an official with the Forest Service at the time who, who had drew our attention to this hill that LDT now sits on. Our, our initial guess on what might have been the best site was another hill about, oh, about five miles up the road from where we are. Um, but you know, it's a matter of setting up instrumentation at each site that measures basically the stability of the atmosphere, the degree of twinkle, if, if you want to put it colloquially, and the, the atmospheric and meteorological conditions. And basically, you want to pick the site that has the best stability, what, what, in, what in astronomical speak we call the seeing. And this turned out to be a site, um, Stephen knows more of the details about this than I do, but it's, it's comparable to the best sites in the continental US, as I understand. It's, yeah, Stephen, maybe you can touch on that. I mean, it is, as, as Jeff has alluded, you always want, you, you always start with the, what's the best site I can get? And it's, as, as he pointed out, uh, how do you minimize the, the twinkle in the, in the stellar objects, but also how dark is the sky relative to that? I and mean, you don't want to be, for example, right on the outskirts of a major metropolitan area. And we are a good 40 miles south of Flagstaff. You can sort of make out where Flagstaff is on a dark night, but we really aren't impacted by glow from that. You can look to the south and you can tell where Phoenix is. But basically the site is pretty dark. So that's one thing in its favor. As Jeff noted, the, the, the size of the typical image we get is small, which is what we aim for. And then the, the flip side of that is you have to balance it against the institutional pragmatic needs or abilities. 
um, many of the best sites in the world are down south in the high Atacama Desert in Chile. But to maintain a facility down there is a very expensive proposition for a small North American institution. And one of the advantages here is that we are under an hour's drive from Flagstaff. If we need to do something, we can come down here on, you know, at, at a moment's notice. Um, you know, logistics is a real part of, of the balance. Uh, a site's no good if you can't keep it operational. And so uh, those, those all factor into it and factor into the sites that you actually can have access to. Um, Jeff pointed out that the Forest Service suggested this site. This is Forest Service land we're sitting on. And so much of Northern Arizona is in fact a checkerboard of Forest Service land, state land, um, there's not an immense amount of private land, in fact, and so you really do have to figure out who has land that will let you use it and under conditions that are appropriate for, the, for, for your use case. And we have had wonderful relations with the Forest Service, both here and at Anderson Mesa, for the better part of half a century. Um, and you know, really have to commend them because they, they pointed us to a, a site that was both within our capability to develop and also met our scientific needs. And that's uh, not true in a lot of places. And, you know, that's something, an important point, Stephen, the partnership, because Little Observatory, you know, we're, we rely on partnerships so, in so many ways. Um, community partners, scientific partners, research partners, um, the Forest Service, and it's really, it's really key to who we are is working with um, whatever the community is and, and you know, coming up with solutions that work really well. And the, the lighting, the lighting um, issue is one good example of that where Jeff has worked with people in the lighting industry to find um, methods that, we work, that work for everybody um, to solve problems. So it's really one of the things that I think Lowell really takes pride in. And I, I wanna take a moment to, to go back in history a little bit a couple of historic repetitions, I guess, because we're talking about the site testing um, to, to find a place to put this new telescope. Well, if we go back to 1894, um, 18 years before Arizona was even a state, um, a fellow named Andrew Douglas arrived here um, at the behest of Percival Lowell to find a place to put his observatory originally. And I just realized today that Andrew Douglas arrived in Flagstaff on April 3rd, 1894, and it was a, exactly 108 years later that the LDT saw first light, which we'll get to in a little bit. But, but it's interesting because Douglas did a site survey across the territory of Arizona, and then about a half a decade later, as the observatory decided, if we're gonna keep doing modern research, we have to get bigger telescopes, and that's when we acquired the Perkins telescope um, a 72 inch diameter telescope, we did site testing again. <clears throat> and that's when we um, set up um, the Anderson Mesa site. And it was during that process that, um, that in the, when they were looking at that site, it looked pretty good, except for there's some searchlights. And working with the Flagstaff City Council, um, a lighting ordinance was created. And that turns out that was the first lighting ordinance in the world. I'm right here in Flagstaff for the expansion of, of our research opportunities. And then half a decade later, here we are again, if we're gonna keep doing modern research, we're doing it again. So, so it's certainly a lot more um, technically advanced than Andrew Douglas riding a mule and a train around the territory with a telescope in a big box that looked like a coffin. Um, but it's kind of the same idea that, that we've done this before and that that's, that's what we do to, to stay at the top of the scientific world. So, okay, we built, we're building the telescope and um, we've, we're finding the site. Let's talk about some of the, the milestones of construction. Um, we, we, we throw out, um, I threw out a term, um, first light, but there's a lot of stuff that happens before that. There's breaking ground, there's, and so, uh, maybe Jeff, you can talk about that a little bit, some of the early milestones of, of the construction. Yeah, this is, a, of course, fading into the, 
the deep neurons of my brain at this point. But uh, I, I, you know, early and one of the very first things I remember doing, um, you know, after we inked the deal with Discovery, which gave us the initial cash infusion to hire the design team and get the design really going. It also supported things like doing the, the site observations and site selection. And so that was a uh, several months of activity. And then once we picked the site, really the first thing I recall going on was just building a road up to this site because the, the existing road, which you can still sort of see is, is way too steep. And so we built this more curvy thing that goes around, spirals around the, the hill a little bit up to the summit, which is at uh, 7,800 feet elevation. And so that was all around 2004-ish. And then I do clearly remember the groundbreaking ceremony, which was July, around July 11th, I think, of 2005. And the main thing I remember, it was an insufferably hot day, uh, even at 7,800 feet. But we had all the the dignitaries from Discovery, including John Hendricks, their, their founder, who was instrumental in getting this, this partnership with Discovery formed. Um, yeah, and had the ceremonial shovels and sort of dug them into this incredibly hard stuff that's, that's up there on the hill. Um, and, and yeah, so then it, it went, you know, it went in fits and starts, right? There was, first you're, you're digging the, the foundation and this, this sort of, uh, Taurus rose out of the ground and there it sat for a while until we got the design for the dome done. And then I think this was around 2008, nine, the, the dome appeared very quickly. And, and so what you see in the, the background image behind me was substantially complete by 2009 ish, except for the, the minor detail that there was no telescope in it. Um, and, and then that started arriving in, in 2010, as we had, had let all the contracts um, for all of the major parts of the telescopes, right at 2008, 2009, right at the stock market crash and recession. And that's a whole nother finances story going on there. Um, and that then led to first light, which, um, Stephen, you can, that, that was, what, well, that was, well, zero flight or something, that was in early 2012. Um, and before we talk about that, Stephen, I just wanted to go back a second. Um, that, that groundbreaking was, was a special moment. We had already signed the contract with Discovery, but, but groundbreaking has a feel all its own when everybody's out there and it, it feels real. And Stephen, were you at the groundbreaking? Okay, I was, okay, but Jeff, um, I'm sure you remember this. One of the one of the most striking things to me, you know, here Lowell is with this century plus heritage of 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 research, and we're looking to continue and build on that, um, looking to the future, um, and that was all brought together as everybody's gathered around, and the program hasn't started yet, but you can start here this chugging sound. And it started getting louder and louder, and it was the trustee driving up the hill. Um, maybe you can speak about it. I, that was such a singular moment to me because it like it connected the eras of Lowell Observatory. Yeah. So this is the the vehicle we affectionately refer to as Big Red. So this is Percival Lowell's 1910 Stevens Durier automobile, which is on display now in our collection center and still runs, although it requires a certain amount of, of coaxing. Um, and, it's, and, and there's only a couple of people on staff who remotely know how to drive it. It's got this very weird clutch system. And it's really not in the kind of state where it, it really wants to be driven 45 miles and up a steep dirt road. But, you know, if you knew our former trustee, Bill Putnam, by gum, he was going to do it. And, and this, this, absolutely classic icon of a bygone era from Lowell arrived on site. And you're right about the groundbreaking. It's, the, you know, these things are ceremonial, but they're important because they do, they make it feel real and they create a sense of community and a sense of like, this is actually gonna happen. And there was a bit of deja vu just uh, last June when we broke ground for the Astronomy Discovery Center. And I was a little, taken aback at myself at, at how affecting that was to feel like, whoa, this, this is actually gonna happen. I did, and, it, and it did. And as you explained, the ground was broken, it was developed. And, and Stephen, let's get back to, um, as the, the telescope advanced and we started 
getting images with it. Um, talk a little bit about zeroth light and what that is, and then the vaunted first light. So, I mean, first light is one of those classic terms that shows up in every major optical system. And so in a sense, we couldn't preempt it. Um, it's the point where everything is in place and you actually, you get light down the tube to some detector and you say, my goodness, the entire thing works. But the reality is we were in a position to test out a whole bunch of stuff months before that. Um, there is a separate story dealing with the secondary mirror, but basically we started putting together the pieces in, in 2010 and 2011. And so by mid 2011, we actually put the primary mirror in the 14 foot mirror you referred to, but we didn't have the secondary mirror in place yet because our secondary wasn't actually done. And so rather than simply let things sit there, we went to the trouble to put a camera up with a uh, re-imaging lens in front of it where the secondary would go. And at that point, we actually had all the pieces of, a, of an operational telescope. We had a mount, we had optics, we had a detector. And so on the night of the 1st of September in 2011, we actually took an image through the, through the telescope that I call zeroth light because from a formal point of view, the institution was still waiting for the secondary mirror and the new camera to call it first light. But the reality is that was the point at which we knew this either would or wouldn't work. And so I have, you know, this, what would you might say looks like a kind of ratty image, but it's this, an image of a star and it's not too bad, not too especially bad. given the fact that in the, 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 our mirror is what's called a thin meniscus mirror, which means it's somewhat flexible and we have a very complex control system for it. And that control system on that night was in fact not even turned on. And even without that, the image is not, you know, it's not this sort of distorted pretzel like thing. It, it, it kind of looked like a little bit like a J, but it wasn't too bad. And two weeks later, two and a half weeks later, we actually had, we had the system on, same camera in the same place, and we had nice round stellar images. And that's when we knew this was gonna work because even without the secondary, we knew that the main components, the mount would track, we could find an object, we could follow it. And the primary mirror, which is far and away, I mean, the truth is that the support system for the primary mirror is the single most complicated piece of this entire telescope, bar none. And knowing that that would work well enough to give us a round image that was about the size we actually expected from the site testing work that had been done years before, was the moment where I, know I and several other people at least kind of went, oh, thank goodness. Because if that image hadn't worked, we'd kind of be stuck with a very large paperweight and we weren't. Um, and in hindsight, we hadn't planned to do the testing that way. It was done that way because the secondary was late because of other circumstances. Um, but if I were to do it again, I would absolutely repeat doing it that way. It was so much easier to test just that one piece. Once you put the secondary in, then you have two mirrors and you don't know where your problem is. Whereas in this case, there's just one. And if it's a problem, it's got to be in the primary mirror. And so it, it really was useful, even though we hadn't planned to do it that way. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a silver lining to the fact that our secondary was late that we were able to continue to make progress and in fact made progress in a way that we, like I say, worked out so well, we would have done it that way again, um, but, but deliberately rather than because we had to. And, and Stephen, I don't know if you noticed a couple of times when you were talking about secondary, Jeff got kind of a smirk on his face. And there's a reason behind that that we're gonna to get to in a few minutes when we talk about some of the challenges that, that had to be overcome. We talked about some of those initially with the financial investment, but we'll get to some of that in just a few minutes. Um, just as a recap, um, this is our, our first of 12 um, monthly um, programs celebrating the 10th anniversary of First Light of the Lowell Discovery Telescope. I'm Kevin Schindler, the Historian and Public Information Officer at Lowell Observatory, joined by Dr. Jeffrey Hall and Dr. Stephen Levine. And it's been really great talking about the early days of the telescope and 
why we did it in the first place. And we're really looking forward to our future programs where we, next time we're gonna do kind of a tour of the facilities and talk about some of the, some of the amazing instruments and the facility itself. Um, but tonight we're, we're kind of talking about why we, why we did this in the first place. Um, we, we do have some questions coming in. Um, some of these we've answered along the way because it's been kind of tied into the current conversation. Um, the rest of them we'll, we'll um, touch on um, a little bit later um, before we end tonight. Um, so we were talking about the development of the telescope and zeroth light and, and first light. So Stephen, maybe you can talk a little bit more after first light. That doesn't mean we're just ready to use the telescope. There's something called commissioning and maybe talk about that process a little bit. So in commissioning, I like to summarize it as commissioning is the process of taking a construction project and turning it into a scientific instrument. Um, and what it really meant was that we had this thing, it was built, it was built to stunning specifications, but we hadn't yet calibrated everything. We didn't, you know, you could, if you, the, the very first night you turned the telescope on, you don't actually know exactly where it's pointing. If you said, go to the moon, something that any child can find on a dark, on a night when the moon is up, the telescope would have missed the moon because we hadn't calibrated how the mount itself was actually pointed. We just knew that it, it, it met a whole bunch of requirements we had given the, ven the, the people who constructed it and they did a heck of a job. And so the first part of commissioning is figuring out where does the mount point? Because you can't do anything else unless you can get an object to look at into your telescope. And then the next one is, okay, you know, I, I mentioned the fact that the optics we knew would work, but they, the, 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 the piece that followed that was making them work up to, the, up to their potential. And so what we did was we tried to intersperse a combination of engineering work, testing each of the various subsystems. You know, we'd say, okay, tonight we're going to work on how to bend the primary mirror to give us a better image. And I, or our head of instrumentation or an instrument scientist or several of us would come out. And what we would do is we would find a star look at the images, use what's known as a wavefront sensor to tell us what the quality of that image looks like. And then we would literally inject forces onto the back. Our mirror is thin enough that you can bend, you literally can bend the glass and you bend it to be closer to the optimum shape and the way you tell that is a better image. And so it's, it's like saying, I, you know, I want to make sure I have the best lens. The, for, for anyone who does photography, essentially our telescope is a camera with a 25,000 millimeter F6 lens. We don't think of it that way most of the time, but then you want your lens to be the best quality optics you can get. And that, you know, getting to that point where it does that regularly without having to think about it, took us the better part of two years, but we couldn't spend the, we didn't spend the entirety of that two years. What we did was we started mostly engineering time and a little bit of science, because you always want to do a little science to make sure that you understand what you're doing. You know, you know what you need to do. And over the course of, you know, some, from, from 2012 through the end of 2014, the amount of time we spent on science essentially slowly increased and the amount of time we spent on the engineering and commissioning ramped down such that by the beginning, January 1st, 2015, we officially declared the telescope fully functional for operations, full-time operations for scientific observation. Um, and the really nice aspect was that because we mixed doing science some nights and doing the commissioning other nights, we had real-time feedback that said, you know, what you did last night really helped or what you did last night broke something. Um, and it's been alluded to, it was all done with a small staff the truth is we didn't really have much in the way of dedicated night staff at the beginning. And so, for example, I would come out and I would haul an engineer, a daytime engineer out with me. And it, was, it turned out to be really helpful because the people who would then have to fix the thing that you found last night had had a chance to see how you really use it. And so it was a mix of, you know, let's go out and let's break something. 
followed by, okay, we broke it, now go fix it. Um, and it was very much this iterative cycle. And every time we'd fix it, hopefully someone would be on a little bit later with science to see that it made a, an appreciable improvement. Um, and so, you know, like I say, I, I kind of thought of my job for years as I break things that other people fix. But that's kind of what commissioning is. You want to find out all the problems. So by the time you're in regular operations, they're not breaking anymore. The, you know, you've, you've figured out how to do this so it works. So when someone says, go to this target, you don't have to think about it. The telescope does all of that directly. And that's kind of where we're at at this point, which is really gratifying. So we've been operating seven years, um, regular science operations. How many, you know, roughly how many nights a year is the telescope in operation? So the, the, the formal, the formal plan is that we do science 300 nights a year and the other 65 nights are for some form of engineering or commissioning or maintenance. Um, and what that, that is about the, the rate that we're actually operating on sky. Um, that is what we schedule because weather obviously keeps us closed on some nights. If it's raining out, we're not observing. Um, but then we also have to plan for, for example, this coming summer, we will be removing the primary mirror to clean, remove and recoat the primary mirror. And that is a multi-week operation during which time we will not be operating. But we budget that into our schedule so that even after that, we still have roughly 300 nights for science. And so we do try, you know, we, we are 24 seven. In, in a real sense, because there's daytime staff here to, to fix whatever was noticed last night. And we still do that cycle. Um, and it's critical to keeping us operating all the time. Um, the reality is that a four meter class telescope is still an unusual enough asset that time is precious, even to those of us who, have, who are lucky enough to have significant access to it. And we'll highlight a lot of that in future episodes including the, the recoding of the mirror, which is just a fascinating process to watch. Um, and so we'll, we'll be talking a lot of, about that in future episodes. Um, let's just talk about one more thing and then we'll get to some questions. Um, we've hinted at this, you know, building something that costs $53 million with however many moving parts are involved with a structure, um, with the telescope itself, um, with people, let's talk about a couple of the challenges we had along the way. And we talked about the financial challenge, but, but let's talk about the one that we've been hinting at um, with a secondary mirror and, and how that was kind of a, as Stephen, you alluded to, kind of a you know, silver lining sort of thing. Jeff, maybe talk about the, um, that day and the second, secondary mirror. <laughs> I remember the, the director at the time, Bob Millis, coming into my office and starting in his characteristically understated way and saying, well, <laughs> and so the, what happened there was you, you have this, this big 1.4 meter mirror blank, and weighs, I, I think the, main, the weight was about 1,100 pounds, and, and you want to, to lighten that up for a couple of reasons. And so you lightweight the mirror, and the way they do that is by using a tool to drill out pockets. I think there's like 76 pockets in the back of the mirror, all in kind of a honeycomb. And that, that lightens it down to about 500 pounds, which decreases the mass up there at the, the end of the telescope. And I think they'd gotten to, I don't know, pocket number 60 or whatever with the, the drilling tool and they pushed a little too hard and punched a 20 centimeter hole through the, the business side of the blank. And it was completely ruined. Um, and so the, the deal was um, we were on the hook to buy another blank, which I recall was about $75,000, but that's what contingency for is for. Um, and then the company was on the hook to redo the figuring, which was multiple months because they've got to drill out a whole bunch of these things. And so, so yeah, that, that ended up uh, delaying the primary, the secondary mirror by I think it was nine or 10 months, Stephen, yeah. but yeah, we put that delay to very good use. And actually we even used that broken secondary. Yeah. Um, 
because the secondary, the, the glass for the mirror has to fit inside a cell that we use to attach it to the telescope. And so it broke through the front, but the outer dimensions were still the same, were, were identical to what the, the real one would be. And so in fact, we ended up test fitting the cell using the broken secondary. And in a way it's kind of nice because you're no longer terribly worried about doing right. anything to it, it's already broken. Um, and they actually sealed the gap that, that, that relieved out of the front of that piece of glass. So we could also, and the, the, the secondary mirror cell actually has a vacuum system on it to help do what's known as float the mirrors so that we are not seeing the support, you're not seeing the structure of the support deforming that mirror. And we could test all of that with the, with the broken or call it a dummy secondary at that point, mm -hmm. even while they were still working on the real one. Um, and so it really had multiple benefits even if we didn't see it that way at the time. I mean, honestly, I would much have preferred to have a finished and ready secondary on the shelf, <laughs> yeah. but we were able to make good use of it um, and in fact, we still have that secondary in storage. What, what, what are some other challenges we had? There may not have been others that were quite so scary, but there certainly were some other challenges. Well, there was the, I mean, the optical misalignment of the primary. Um, you know, we, it, it turned out our, our primary mirror has a beautiful figure. It's, it's just slightly figured in the wrong place, owing to a, a lab misalignment and, and you know, these things happen. In, in, in some ways, I guess it was kind of the inverse of what happened with Hubble, right, where you had the wrong figure on the mirror in the right place. We had a comparatively easier problem by having the right figure in the wrong place. And so now, uh, actually, if you look at that, the back of that cell behind you, Kevin, uh, Stephen can describe this better than I can. The, all the, all the, the actuator caps are not quite in the center of the, the holes in the cell. Yeah. I mean, basically, when we found out there was about three weeks of oh dear, what are we gonna do? Because as Jeff has alluded to, the, the, the folks who figured the mirror, the, the, the figure was better than contract specification. They did a beautiful job. It's just, it was, it was literally shifted by eight millimeters from where it needed to be. And that sounds like a very small amount for something that is 14 feet in diameter, but eight millimeters on an optical system is an enormous offset, but it turns out to be one of the most difficult measures to make when testing a piece of glass like this. And the solution turned out, as Jeff has also alluded to, to be something surprisingly simple. In the sense we had enough leftover space in the supports that attach the mirror to the mirror cell, the structure of the mount, that we could literally make a new set of these, it's essentially 120 support pieces. And what we did was we took the design and instead of them being centered, they literally moved the mounting holes eight millimeters to one side for the entire set of these things, which allowed us to shift the entire piece of glass to put the, the optical axis on center like it was supposed to be. But there was a three weeks of, you know, before it really occurred to us that we could do it that way, three weeks of serious brain scratching and worry that we had a, you know, the, the thought of sending the mirror back for refiguring was almost beyond contemplating. And it, it, it to, to understand the, the magnitude of it, the primary mirror was roughly a six year project. And this would have added easily another year to it is my guess. Um, and that's, you know, rebuilding the mounts turned out to be a few weeks, thankfully. Um, when, in any project like this, I mean, this isn't the scale of an Apollo spacecraft type thing, but still there, you try to plan for everything and then stuff happens and you work together to come up with a good solution. And, and it really is making lemonade out of lemons in so many ways that you make the most of it. And that's what, that's what the team certainly has done. Looks like we have just about five minutes left. So let's get to a couple of the questions we didn't get to. Um, um, one, and, and we're going to, gosh, this question, we're going to be answering over the next 12 months in this, this series, but um, maybe, Jeff, you can summarize some of those long-term observations and research that, will be, that are being done with LDT and will be done. Um, sure. I, I've already mentioned one. You know, we've got this cool new spectrograph from Yale, and so 
you know, ongoing observations of, um, you know, planets around other stars. Um, you know, our, our astronomers have used the, the LDT for anything from characterizing, you know, asteroids and near Earth objects to systematic observations of very small galaxies. Um, our partners have done uh, ongoing follow up observations of these incredibly violent events we call gamma ray bursts. And, and that's taking advan advantage of the very rapid instrument switching capability of our telescope when these things goes off. You can get to these these events and begin characterizing them very early in their in their before they start to decay. Um, so as you know, as Stephen said, this is kind of a, a Swiss Army knife that's equipped with an array of imagers and spectrometers operating in uh, various parts of the spectrum, from the, the optical and you know, ultraviolet out into the infrared. Um, so, want to add anything, Stephen, that jumps to your mind? Well, I, I would just say that one of the neat things is that it, the telescope, essentially from a time perspective, we can, because we own it, we can countenance programs that can go on for years, but because of the way the telescope and instrument is structured, we can also respond to things in literally the course of minutes. Um, we support what are known as target of opportunity observations where someone can get an alert for something that happened a few minutes ago and they can call in and interrupt under certain circumstances, interrupt whoever is observing. And so if the supernova of the century went off tomorrow, someone could be observing it half an hour after the alert came out. And so, you know, it's one of these, we can, we can turn the telescope on a dime literally, but we can also project for very long term. You know, we would like to, we have the, the luxury, I should say, of being able to contemplate programs that might go on for years, maybe even decades. Although I don't think there are decade long programs at the moment on the telescope. Um, and that is unusual for a four meter class in the sense, you know, most of them are instrument are, are set up for much bigger consortia that have much more competing needs. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is a, it is a, an unusual and really positive kind of an option for us. It's an asset that, that we are delighted to be able to, to access. Well, here's another question from a viewer in Bend, Oregon. And we'd like to say, hello, we were, we, Lowell Observatory, were there just a few years ago for the Great American Eclipse. And we're looking forward to the next Great American Eclipse in 2024. And we'll be um, doing an event down in Texas. And so that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, so the question, and this is a good one, how are communications and data transfer from the telescope to research astronomers? Do they have to build a system? And what was the challenge of doing that? Um, I actually. We, we, we made a concerted effort to use industry standards. So in fact, all, all data essentially go over standard network connections. We have a microwave link from the telescope to a, a radio tower on a relatively nearby mountain. And the telescope just looks like another, another node on the internet. Um, and so the nice city is we originally started with the idea that our observers would come to the telescope to do their observations and then they could just load their data onto their laptop or some sort of a digital medium and take it with them. But even from the beginning, we planned for the idea that people might observe remotely, that they would connect over the internet to the computers that run the instruments and observe from home. And the reasons were very selfish in the sense that when we were commissioning, it was really convenient to be able to ask the engineering staff to check on something while you were trying to work on it. And if they had to come out, it would cost another hour and a half for them to come out and then go home, whereas they could just log in and five minutes later tell you, well, this is working that way. And so what that really meant was that we've been remote observer capable almost from the beginning. And especially with, with the pandemic, our observers are not coming to the telescope. They're all observing from either their home or their home institution. And what they do is they just literally log in over the internet. And as they take their data, they can just download it much as you would download from any other site. And all of the instrument control is replicated to their machine by virtue of, of 
uh, standard industry standard tools. We tried to minimize the specialty stuff we wrote. And that has meant that the stuff is also stable and easy to maintain. Well, we're, we're just about out of time, but let's take one more quick question, Jeff. Um, this is a great one. Um, what's the life expectancy of the telescope? Well, when we, we do the amortization calculation, you know, we're, we're basically basing on, on 50 years. Um, but you know, the, 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 there's the telescope, there's the instruments that it's, that it's attached to as well. You know, the, the Perkins telescope at Anderson Mesa is a hundred years old and, and our partners at Boston University who now own that have equipped it with considerably more modern instrumentation. So even though it's a very old telescope, it's got modern capable instruments on it. So, you know, the, the answer here is, is we don't know exactly, but it's measured in many decades. I mean, it will be our flagship for quite some time to come. So you'll still be the director um, when we start looking at the next generation, of course. Right, Jeff? <laughs> right. <laughs> well, this has been a great start to our year-long celebration of the Lowell Discovery Telescope. Um, we're out of time, so we're going we're gonna, to um, end it here. Um, Drs. Tall and Levine, thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks, Maddie Mooney and Cody Halfmoon for behind the scenes work and making everything run. And thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, next month, we'll, we'll kind of do a, a tour of the telescope and facility um, and talk about the instrument cube, which is really one of the main things that makes this so outstanding. Um, and, and we'll look forward to other programs down the, down the road every month. So thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you. Been a pleasure.